So I'm on, right? Okay. You're on. Well, uh, I really appreciate the chance to be here. Leslie, thank you. Uh, uh, and the chance to talk to all of you to start this uh, conversation about the common good and, and what's working and what isn't working and why, uh, why it doesn't work. I, I, I think about my own life in politics and, and I, I think sometimes it seems a little strange that every two years we go out to take back the country from the people we just gave it to. It, 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 so, something is not quite working right. Uh, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why it's not working right. Uh, I, I uh, actually recall uh, the first little germ of, of concern that uh, came in my head when I was a member of Congress and I was having town meetings in my congressional district in Oklahoma City uh, and was asked why I had not done something that this person wanted me to do and which I agreed with and wanted to do. And I gave the typical political answer. Now, I'm a, it's already been spilled that I'm a Republican. So uh, I, I mentioned in, in response that, well, I'm a Republican, as they knew, and I introduced the bill, but the Democrats controlled the Congress. And they wouldn't let me do it, and they were blocking me, and it was all terrible. And, and one of the people in the room got up and, and pointed his finger at me and said, I am so damn sick and tired of hearing Republican this, Democrat that. Everybody in the room stood up and cheered, and I never did it again. Uh, and and it, it, it caused me to start looking at the whole idea uh, of a system that is based not on Americans sitting down and working cooperatively on problem solving, but as though our national government was the NFL. Uh, and, and that it was our job to divide into teams and to stop the other teams. So I start thinking about this, and, and there is, um, I, I guess you all have this, I don't know, but it was on the uh, description that I have about what we were going to talk about, and it starts with this. It starts with, by most measures, Americans no longer trust the representative institutions that bind our nation's civil society. Well, what's wrong with that? The systems we have now are not representative. What's happening in Washington does not reflect where the American people are. How did that come about? How, uh, it, it's, let, let me start by saying that I do not want to argue that the people who serve in government, either in the executive branch or the legislative branch in Washington or, or in Illinois, uh, are not well-meaning patriotic people. They are, they're smart. You know, something else is wrong. And what's wrong, I'm going to argue, is the system that we have created in which they live and in which they operate. There are a couple of basic truths that are important to the way our government is supposed to function. One is representation. The idea that we're, we're not going to be subjects, we're going to be citizens, so instead of the government telling us what to do, we tell the government what to do. And the idea is that we will be represented. You in your congressional district, you in your state, are going to have people in Washington who speak for you, who know you, who know your concerns, uh, and that take that, those concerns to Washington. And the other is because there are now over 300 million of us, and we're all very different. We have different backgrounds. We have different religions. We have different life experiences. At some point, no matter how firmly you believe in a point of view, and no, no matter how strongly you argue for that point of view, you have to, in the end, be willing to compromise. You have to be finally able to say, I've got as much as I can, or I've lost you know, less than I might lose, and let's sit down and work it out, because we have to make sure that our troops get their weapons, that our bridges don't fall down, that we pay our bills, we have to function as, as a government. And neither of those things is happening, representation nor the uh, ability to compromise. And here's why. Yeah, the, the first four presidents of the United States, who, as you know, disagreed on a lot of different things, but, but I found something that all four of them agreed on. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison all said these things repeatedly, over and over. They wrote them, they said, don't create political parties. Do not create political parties. This was, this was a very serious warning from Washington and Adams and Madison and Jefferson. They had parties, they had parties then. But they weren't like the parties we have now. They were, they were parties where you might have three or four or five things that you agreed on uh, and you stood together, but not on everything all the time. 
So it didn't matter whether it's a budget or a spending bill or who should be on the Supreme Court where you automatically divided into rivals where your job was to defeat the other guy. Uh, and they warned us not to do that, and, the, and we did. So let, I'm going to just give you a couple of examples of where we have gotten off track giving power to the political parties that have undermined our system. One is that we allow the political parties to control access to the ballot. A couple of very quick examples of that. Uh, and I don't care when, if I mention names of candidates, I don't care which one you would have been for. That's, that's not the point. So down the road in Delaware, with a million people, uh, they had a primary. Everybody, Bo Biden, Joe's son, did not run for the uh, Senate because he knew he couldn't win. Everybody knew who would be the next senator. A guy named Mike Castle had been governor, former congressman. But he got challenged in a primary uh, by a lady named Christine O'Donnell. She beat him in the primary. And so he could not any longer be considered to be senator from Delaware. Why? It's because we allow the parties to control access to the ballot. And in the million people in Delaware, only 30,000 voted for Christine O'Donnell. 30,000 in a million. And that meant that the other, because there, oh, there, there, there's a little confluence of events here. So you have closed party primaries that determine who you can choose among when it comes to, you know, who serves in the Senate or the House. But the parties have also colluded to create what they call sore loser laws which means if you sought your party's primary, in a primary or convention, and you sought your party's nomination and you lost, no matter how few people voted in that primary, you're not eligible to be on the ballot. And that's the case in 46 of the 50 states. So that's how somebody like Todd Aiken becomes a nominee of a major political party. So uh, that's part of it. The same thing happened in Utah where Senator Robert Bennett because 2,000 people in a convention in Salt Lake City didn't vote for him. The 3 million people uh, in Utah were told he can no longer be your choice. That's the political system we, we've created. So one other thing they do. We, we've allowed the political parties to control redistricting. To control, and you might think, you know, that, how, that's pretty boring, right? I mean, you know about gerrymandering, but I mean, who, who really cares? The, most of you, or you wouldn't be here, you know, very knowledgeable about government. You could probably name almost everything in the U.S. Constitution. One thing most of you would forget, and it's one of the most important parts of the Constitution, that every single member of the U.S. House or Senate must be an actual inhabitant of the state from which they're elected. The idea is that you represent the people, you know them, you're familiar with them. So let me tell you my story. I am a city guy. You can't see my loafers from you know, back there, but I, you know, I'm, I'm a city dude. To, to me, groceries come, you know, from a grocery store. You know, I, I've been on a farm once, but uh, I, so I, as a Republican, I won a district. I was elected as, as a Republican in a district that had not elected a Republican since 1928, and there was 74% Democrat. And it just drove the majority uh, in the other party crazy. You know, they controlled the state legislature, so they redrew my district. I don't know how many of you have been to Oklahoma, but, you know, all of New England fits inside of Oklahoma. Uh, and, and my district was in the middle of the state, and they drew it up then from uh, Oklahoma City in the middle of the state all the way up to the Kansas border, halfway across to Arkansas. Uh, and, and I said, look what they did to me. I'm a politician. I'm so very self-referential. It's, it's all about me. Uh, <laughs> And I would tell my students, look what they did to me. And they really didn't do it to me, did they? Because now I'm the city guy who knows nothing about farms. I was now representing wheat farmers and cattle ranchers and small town merchants, and I could not speak for them. And all over the United States, we have people being, quote, represented in Congress by somebody who doesn't really know them and who is not a representative of, of them and what their concerns are. So one final thing I'll, I'll say and, and pass on. Uh, I'm going to skip over money because I know we're going to get to that. I mean, you know, we, uh, you know, corporations are people. I mean, you know, give me a break. Uh, anyways, <laughs> we'll, we'll skip that. But in the House of Representatives, where I served for 16 years, the focal point, the, the choke point for all major legislation is the committee system. 
How do you get on a committee where you decide whether a bill moves forward, whether you decide whether the policies will be seriously considered by the whole House or the Senate? The party controls appointments to the committees and controls those appointments in exchange for your promise to stick with the party line on the major issues. Take your brain out of your skull and hand it to your party leaders and do their bidding or you, know, you don't get the committee process. So good news, very fast. The American people have had it. They've had it. 42% of Americans today are registered as independent. USA Today had an article that the American people are fleeing from the political parties. I'm not trying to get rid of the parties, but I am trying to get rid of their control over the political system so that we can have a system that represents we the people, and so they start thinking of themselves not as Republicans or Democrats, but as Americans.